Hey, welcome everybody to our Global Family Church time. Uh, amazing time in this last hour, praying for elections that are happening around the world. Um, you know, it's a fraught topic sometimes. Uh, politics are always very contentious. And I think we can make two mistakes. We can think that everything depends on political leaders. We know God can work through good or bad political leaders and has throughout history. But we can also make a mistake of thinking it doesn't matter um, or we'd be better off with bad leaders. And that's not true. We don't ever want to pray for ungodly leaders. Um, when I was traveling the world, it struck me so much that every nation we visited, people love their nation and they want godly government in their nation. And so we always know that is a, a good thing to pray for. Um, so uh, thanks so much to everybody for praying with us today on this topic. And we're going to hear more from Jason uh, in this next hour. Uh, Jason, you want to give us any announcements on the upcoming uh, prayer activities, especially related to the Muslim world? Or are you going to cover that in your talk? Uh, not in my talk, but yeah, real quick, uh, April 5th is our global day of prayer for the muslim world coming up this is the muslim uh, what's called the night of power where muslims around the world are uh, seeking for revelation for a spiritual experience and encounter and we want to pray that they encounter the lord jesus christ amen uh there's massive evangelism going on during what's called ramadan and so we want to pray and, and create this global canopy of prayer on behalf of the mission work, the evangelism, the Bible translation, uh, the church planting that's happening uh, during this season. Uh, we're going to send you in the chat uh, our 30-day Muslim prayer guide. We're going to launch that on March 10th. So I'd love to have you join us in your prayer times praying. Uh, we have a city that we can pray for each day, unreached city, unreached peoples in that city. Uh, and then again, it'll culminate on April 5th on that night of power. Uh, we're going to do that here on the Global Family Prayer Room. And so we encourage you to invite your uh, teams, your prayer teams, your churches, your families to join us on that day. Uh, believing again for 100 million people to be praying with us for gospel movements amongst the, the precious Muslim peoples, our cousins. So amen. Hallelujah. Amen. One last thing. Um, for those in the U.S., we've got a summit, 10-day summit coming up um, May 9th to 12th in Grove City, Pennsylvania. It's a great opportunity to connect with folks in person. Um, and then we also have one in Europe, April 16th, to 19th it's going to be in frankfurt germany if you'd like if you're in europe if you'd like to connect uh, another just great opportunity for in-person connection um team any other announcements all right jason you got everything on my list awesome thanks andrea that's that's saying so i feel good about that <laughs> all right jason over to you Thank you, thank you. I'd like to ask if I could, Dennis Crane, could you pray for this uh, hour's uh, teaching here? And um, we both have a great love and passion, of course, for the supremacy of Jesus. And we know ultimately that Jesus is the answer for all of our nations and the ultimate answer to all of our prayers. Amen. So could you pray and just commit this time, Dennis, and then I'm going to share uh, from the scriptures here for a few minutes. Maybe some time at the end for some question and answer. Thank you. Father, we come in adoration of your son and his beauty, his supremacy, his desire for us to receive our <clears throat> full inheritance. And we want him to receive his full inheritance. So I ask that you would be part of uh, removing the blinders for our eye, from our eyes to see the beauty of Jesus. So we ask for uh, messengers to uh, be raised up 
to open the eyes and that you're we'd be able to prophesy to the winds from the north south east and west of the supremacy of jesus so your spirit would be poured out on all flesh and the mighty army would rise up in adoration and power and authority for your kingdom advancement preparation for your return we love you jesus amen amen thank you dennis hallelujah well, praise God. That was a good hour of prayer. Uh, wanted to start with what Jody started with again, just as a, another reminder. First uh, Timothy chapter two, where Paul gives us uh, instructions to tells the, the church at Ephesus. First of all, that I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. So God's calling us to pray for all people. And second, uh, pray for kings and all who are in high positions or in positions of influence or governmental positions. And as we pray for them, we're praying that the results would be two things. One, that we would lead peaceful and quiet lives. The shalom of the Lord, the kingdom of God would be in our nations, in our, in our lands. And that also we would, it says next, uh, <clears throat> this is good, meaning this types of prayer is good. It pleases the Lord. It's pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior. And then the second result would say, this God, he says, he desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. So as we pray, and this would please God, it would create peace in the land, shalom in the land. It would also create an atmosphere, I believe, where the gospel can go forth in power, where these all people we're praying for will have an opportunity to hear the great good news of Jesus, because we know this is God's desire, that all men would come to a knowledge of the truth. And so... I think when we talk about how to pray for the elections, we know there's 66 elections happening this year globally. Uh, I don't know of a time in history when we've had this many at this level. Um, and uh, uh, probably, you know, 49 to 50% of the world's population. So we're talking four to five billion people are going to be voting this year. Uh, that's a pretty big deal, and I think we need to be praying into that again. How do we pray? How do we pray? Well, one thing I would say right off the bat, as we heard from Jody as well, uh, we are in a season of great harvest in these days, and I believe it's going to increase. And this is one of our strategies, I think, that God gives us. Let's pray for righteous leaders to be appointed this year in our nations, in each of our nations, for this ultimate purpose that the harvest would come, that there would be the greatest number of people that would have an opportunity to hear about Jesus. Amen. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to talk a little bit next, kind of back up just a little bit and talk about what Jesus says about uh, political theology is what I'm going to call this. What does Jesus say about politics? What does Jesus say about government? And so if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Mark 12, Mark 12, 13 through 17. Uh, this is God's word. It says, they sent to Jesus some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. And they came and they said to him, teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And so they brought one and he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And so Jesus said to them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and render to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Uh, I don't know about you, but I uh, think one of the subtle blessings of COVID, of the COVID-19 pandemic, 
that we all experienced in each of our nations was that it forced uh, many of our churches to think more deeply about the relationship between the church and the state. Uh, let me just say on the front end that it's my conviction that the gospel transforms everything about human life. Not part of human life, or, or I would say uh, no part of human life is uh, untouched by the gospel. But I think for many churches, uh, politics remains untouched at times. I know this is at least true in our nation here in America. There can be this tendency for Christians to have um, fear of their church becoming partisan, right? Our church might become Republican church or a de Democratic church. And so, you know, they say, let's just leave politics out of the pulpit. <laughs> and I'll wrestle with this person myself with this question. But when COVID hit, right, churches had to start really thinking about their relationship to the state. Because when the government is shutting down churches, you can't avoid that question anymore. Amen. And I'm not going to talk about that issue right now, but we do need to think clearly about what our theology is regarding government and politics. What do we think of the state? You know, you're forced to confront it in these types of moments, in these types of situations. And I think that's been a good thing for most of us. Christians throughout history have had to deal with sinful, unbelieving, and often wicked governments. And so, and there's many of those today. And so we have to think through the relationship between the gospel and the state as a church community. So now this passage that I just read, I think maybe the most famous political statement in the whole Bible, where Jesus says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Now, it'd be very e easy to interpret what Jesus is saying as, let's keep politics and religion separate <laughs> Caesar's got his stuff, right? God's got his stuff. And so Caesar can do his political things over here, and religious people can do their private religion over here. Let's not mix up the two things. And uh, <clears throat> I don't think that's what Jesus is saying, though. <laughs> In fact, I think if we read it the way we should read it, um, I think this becomes one of our greatest uh, theologies of politics in Scripture. Uh, if we read it wrongly, like I just mentioned, uh, that's exactly, I think, what Caesar would want us to do. <laughs> or think about your um, <clears throat> political leader today. You would say, yeah, great, you know, I'll be over here running the government. However, I want you, and you, you can kind of pray in your closets, you can read your Bibles, I'll leave you alone, you leave me alone, everything's good. Everyone will be happy. Let's not mix them together. And unfortunately, the divorcing of the state and the spiritual life is exactly the opposite, I think, of what Jesus is saying in this verse. I think these verses give us a profound understanding, a baseline for Christian political ideology. I think Jesus' words here are uh, helpful. I think they're simple, and it's just a few words that he says. I, if you think of the depth of them, I think they can lead us to all kinds of good insights. Uh, don't have time today to talk about everything, but during this election year globally, where literally half the world's population is going to vote for the highest level of governmental leaders, right? We're talking about presidents and prime ministers. It's an important topic for us to, to think about. Uh, I want to answer just two simple questions from this passage from Mark chapter 12. Uh, and this is what they are first. What does Jesus reject in our political theology? What does he warn us about? And then what does Jesus encourage in our political theology? Okay, so what does he reject and what does he encourage? And I've got two answers to each of those questions that we can find in this passage. So the first question is this, what does Jesus reject in our political theology? One of the things you notice about this passage is verse 13. It says, and they sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians, two different groups of people here, to trap him in his talk. Um, 
these two groups that come together to challenge Jesus. It's the Pharisees and the Herodians, which is it's pretty odd because these two groups have basically opposite worldviews, <laughs> and they would have been enemies of each other. And so all of a sudden, they're kind of joining on the same team to challenge Jesus. <clears throat> and I think that they both represent versions of political action that Jesus rejects. The first one is that Jesus rejects the Pharisees, who I believe represent revolution. Jesus rejects the Pharisees who represent revolution, okay? Revolution means when you're overthrowing existing authority structures. That's what a revolution is in real simple terms. And so you'll notice the question that the Pharisees bring to Jesus in verse 14, right? It says, they came to him and they said to teacher, we know that you're true, that you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. <clears throat> Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? Now, that's exactly the kind of question that the Pharisees would ask, because the Pharisees they um, were under the influence, I believe, of, of people that were called zealots. They were influenced and kind of came from that foundation. And the zealots were a movement of Jews in the first century who wanted to revolt against the Roman Empire. And actually about you know, 20 years before Jesus' ministry, there was one Jew, in particular Judas, the Galilean, who started a revolt. And the Romans had imposed the poll tax on the Jews, which is the exact tax that the Pharisees are talking about here in this text. Judas, this Galilean, got a bunch of people together, and he's like, we're going to go up to war with the Romans. And the Romans were pretty, you know, they, they pretty quickly stamped it out, of course. But that spirit of revolt continued among the Jews all the way until the Jewish wars that started in 66 AD. This ended bad for Jerusalem, where the city was sacked, besieged, and destroyed by the Romans. Okay, so basically what the Pharisees are asking Jesus, are you on the side of the people being oppressed by the Romans? Are you going to help us tear down the authorities who are over us, oppressing us? Tearing down authorities is a spirit of revolution. Now, normally when Christians think of Pharisees, you know, you, you've read through the Gospels and you hear about the Pharisees, you know, what does it make you think of? I, I think most people think of uh, being very conservative, right? Traditional people in the church are judging everyone, a little bit self-righteous, kind of making up rules about everything, right? And, of course, I think that's an appropriate parallel uh, of the Pharisees. But I think there's also a definite case to be made that the progressives in our generation also bear the marks of the Pharisee. It's, it's often the left in our culture that wants to tear down the authority structures that are in place. And just as the Pharisees were always policing what everyone said, and what everybody thought, the progressives today are the ones who make all the rules about what's politically correct, right? <laughs> what can be said, what can't be said. And what's behind this, there's a pharisaical spirit about it. The Pharisees were an oppressed people, right? The Jews had for centuries lived under the pagan powers of the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, Medes, uh, the Greeks, and now finally the Romans. And it had produced this profound resentment in them. So Jesus' answer to the Pharisees' revolutionary spirit, I think, is incredibly insightful. This is what he says, verse 15. But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and look at it. Let me look at it. And they brought out one of them, whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. Well, <laughs> I mean, Jesus is basically saying, your guys are always saying, if you really love God, you would stick up for the oppressed people and go fight the Romans. But you have Roman coins in your pocket. <laughs> and when the Romans make you rich, you're a part of the Roman system. And yet you want to judge the Roman system and tear down the authority structure when they try to impose taxes on you. So the big problem with political revolution is hypocrisy. People criticize people who are in power so that they can get power for themselves. 
And then they do the very things that they have been criticizing the people in power for doing. Uh, right? Hypocrisy is the problem with the revolutionary spirit. And one of the things we learn right from the Pharisees is that the most revolutionary people are also the most tyrannical. They're the most controlling of other people. And that truth, guys, has played out countless times in history. I mean, I would say, uh, as I've studied, communism is basically a revolutionary political system. At its heart, right, it says that all of human history is about oppressed people overthrowing the authorities and the people in power that are over them, right? Basically, every communist revolution has ended up being massively oppressive. The oppressors are just as oppressive as the people that are oppressing them. (laughs) So there's hypocrisy at its roots. I think that's what Jesus is really addressing here. And so one of the most important pieces of Jesus' political ideology is that it is not revolutionary, okay? He didn't form an army, right? He didn't overthrow the Romans. And actually later in Romans 13, the Apostle Paul is going to say that the pagan authorities are servants of God, and he commands Christians to pay their taxes. <clears throat> so Jesus warns the Pharisees, listen, if you're going to go to war with Rome, it will only lead to destruction, and it really did. Right? The Pharisees were destroyed. Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans, okay? So the first thing is that Jesus rejects the Pharisees who represent revolution. But there's another path that he also rejects. Jesus rejects the Herodians. And I think the Herodians represent resignation. Okay, so they've resigned themselves to the political structures of the Roman Empire. So while the Pharisees said that they were um, uh, not corrupted by Roman power while they had Roman coins in their pocket, (laughs) the Herodians were those who had aligned themselves with the Romans. Uh, The name Herod, right, it comes from the dynasty of King Herod the Great. And he was a half Jew, the most famous for building a second second temple. So when you read the Gospels, it says Jesus went into the temple. That was the temple that was built by Herod. And he was criticized by many of the Jews for changing different aspects of Jewish worship. But most importantly, Herod was was really a client king of the Romans. Okay, so <clears throat> when the Pharisees asked Jesus, should we pay taxes? He says, yes, you should pay the taxes. And then the Pharisees are going to say, why aren't you sticking up for the oppressed people and revolting against the Romans? But Jesus says, no, you shouldn't. I mean, sorry, Herod says, no, you shouldn't pay the taxes. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, to the Herodians are going to say this. The Herodians are going to say, oh, you're starting revolt, right? As the Pharisees say, you shouldn't pay the taxes. The Herodians are going to be the opposite, say you you Pharisees are starting a revolt, and we're going to have to have you arrested. So see the difference between the two? And so they're going to try and trap him in this. Now, Now, the Herodians, again, I think represent resignation. And they're basically said the, the Romans are in power and there's there's nothing that we can do about it. And they've resigned themselves politically that if you can't beat them, then join them. That's a good way to say it. So, so they have no moral voice against the evils of Rome. The Herodians represent resignation. And I think Jesus rejects that as well. When you think about it, what ways as Christians now, where we are becoming resigned, like the Herodians, to the political structures that are around us? How is resignation a temptation for us? Well, I think one way is that we become overly partisan, right? If Christians begin to align the gospel with the Republican Party or the Democratic Party or nationalism, we could become complicit in the sins of both parties, right? I'm not saying that Christians shouldn't serve at political parties. In fact, I think in many ways, that's what we need to do. That's the system of the world. But Christians need to maintain, we need to maintain a critical distance and posture toward them, okay? And the way that we do that is we maintain the centrality of the church, of the ecclesia in cultural change, okay? 
the ecclesia is called to be a kingdom embassy, a kingdom outpost. And so we believe that God's key agent in cultural change is not the state, but the church. The state is secondary to what God is doing through the church. And so that's one way that I think we can become resigned. I think a second version of resignation is probably a bigger issue, and it's the privatizing of the Christian faith. It's when we say Christianity is just about individual souls getting to heaven when they die, or simply only about my personal relationship with Jesus. It's, it's a private spirituality. You know, we certainly you know, do have our personal relationship with Jesus, amen. But we forget Jesus' message was that the kingdom of heaven is establishing itself on the earth. Jesus is building a culture, a civilization, a city on the earth that's called a Christian embassy, a kingdom embassy. <clears throat> so if by overly privatizing the Christian faith, then we give up our cultural voice. So I believe Jesus' political theology rejects both revolution and resignation. In just one sentence, Jesus responds with maybe the most profound political statement ever spoken. And so that answers our second question, okay? So, so we looked at what does Jesus reject in our political theology, but second, what does Jesus encourage in our political theology? The reason I'm sharing this foundation is because it's important in terms of how we pray for these elections. What direction does he lead us? And this is Jesus' answer, verse 17. Jesus said to them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And it says they marveled at him. And of course, yeah, they marveled at him because Jesus is very clear, right? Uh, in fact, I think he's very clever. They're trying to trap him, and he found a clever way out of the trap. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure they realize the implications of how profound a statement that Jesus had that he's inviting us to meditate on and to think about what does this really mean? What should be rendered to Caesar and what should be rendered to God? That's the question that we need to be asking. So I think this statement tells us two things now about how you and I should approach political change. The first thing is that the church must work for reformation. The church must work for reformation instead of a revolution. It's reformation. And now what's so brilliant about what Jesus is saying is that on the one hand, he says, all right, you're, you're going to have to get used to it. You're going to have to live under unbelieving Caesars, and you're going to have to pay taxes to them. Right? That's been the testimony throughout all church history. And so that's the, that's the structure that God has in place in this age. And you're going to have to get used to that, right? But when he says that Caesar's image is on the coin, and then he says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. I mean, you could say, well, are you saying that all the money that has Caesar's image on it belongs to Caesar? I mean, could, could he just tax us as much as he wanted and take as much of that money and that we owe to him because it's got his image on it? Well, no. I mean, because he follows up with this statement, to render to God what is God's. And you have to ask the question now, what belongs to God? Is it just spiritual things? You have to ask, well, the coins have Caesar's inscription. What is God's inscription on it? Everything, <laughs> amen. God made everything, and everything He made belongs to Him and bears His mark. And of course, most importantly, God's ins 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 inscription is on every single human being. They all owe Him allegiance. So, all of human culture then is owed to God. And of course, there's one human being in particular who has God's inscription on Him. That's important for this discussion. Who is that? Well, it's Caesar. Caesar has God's inscription on him, <laughs> and he owes God allegiance. It's not that Caesar is over here in the political world and God is over here in the spiritual world. Jesus is saying Caesar has a legitimate authority that's been given to him by God, and we should respect him. But ultimately, 
everything belongs to the Lord, including Caesar, including your president or prime minister. <laughs> and Caesar will have to give an account to God for how he governs the people that God has made. He is God's servant. So this is a major question in a political theology that if Caesar, the civil magistrate, is God's servant, and if Jesus is the king of kings, which means that all the kings owe Jesus' obedience, Jesus' obedience, king. He is king of all kings. The Bible is very clear. He is Lord of all lords. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. That means he has authority over everyone who has authority. Then how does Caesar learn what Jesus expects of him if he's God's servant? He has to learn it from the Bible. And that's where you learn what God's will is. And of course, who teaches people the Bible? The church does. The ecclesia does. We have to be a voice for the truth of God's word. Amen? In these days. And so while I don't, I do believe that, that the church and the state have distinct authorities from God, right? The church plays a unique role in shining the light of God's truth on every area of life. And that includes the political realm. So Reformation is about Christians offering all of life to God, including our political thinking, our elections, and the great historical Reformation. We know even of the Reformation of the 16th century is one of the Reformations that God has done in history that had massive societal change, right? Affected every aspect of human culture, from the church to the family to the arts to education and to the political life. I mean, political life in Europe massively changed during the Reformation. And it all stemmed from Christians like you and I reading the scriptures, believing in the grace of Jesus Christ, and then thinking through the implications of the gospel in every area of culture, including our political thinking and how we vote and how we pray for who we vote for. And so they're creating a culture, a kind of civilization that was centered on the person of Jesus and his kingdom. That's what the Lord is doing. And so while revolution means overthrowing political authorities, reformation means shine the light of God's truth and the gospel on the political authorities as well on every aspect of life. Amen. And when the church does that, a second thing happens, okay? So it's not just that the church works for reformation to bring all of life under the wisdom and lordship of Jesus and the scriptures, but the second thing is that when the church be does this, the church actually becomes a resistance movement. Now, when we do that, we become a resistance movement. Now, now the word resistance can mean different things, and you know, we need to be a little careful about that, you know, obviously. I mean, Romans 13, 2 says, uh, we'll get this right. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities reject, resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment, right? So I understand resist there, though, to mean revolt, right? Revolting where Jesus did not revolt against the state. The state has a God-given authority, and that we should be a model law-abiding citizens. We 100% believe that as a church, amen? But there's no way that you can read the New Testament or the church, hist or church history and not think that the church is going to have clashes with the state. It happens all over the New Testament, and it's happened many times throughout church history. Jesus told his disciples this was going to happen, and this is not an armed resistance, but a spiritual resistance of truth. Uh, <clears throat> I heard a, a portion of a sermon by a pastor this past week, and he was talking about how he had been visiting a country in East Asia. It was a country that's close to Christianity. And uh, <clears throat> I was there, one of the, the locals uh, who was a Christian brought him to this bookstore, 
and he showed him in the bookstore that there was a whole Christian section in the bookstore. There's all kinds of books about discipleship and honoring God with your money and marriage and all these things. And, and the man who was from this country said, what do you see is missing from this section of Christian books? <laughs> The pastor looks at it and he's like, I don't know. Looks like they're Christian books, you know. <clears throat> I don't see really what it is. And the friend says, There are no books on the church. The government of this closed country knows that if Christians are just individuals, they're not a threat, right? If, if Christians just care about their finances and their friends and their devotional life and their 30 day Bible reading and the rest of it, <laughs> they're not really a threat. But when they, they become a threat, when they organize together because of their allegiance to Jesus, is to a different king. Governments today know that churches like this really are a resistance movement. We are part of a kingdom with a different king that's not of this world, that is coming to this world and is being established in this world as we speak. In fact, I believe it is ever increasing, but it's not of this world. Um, I think about what's going on in China today. Um, and uh, I had some opportunities to meet with some of these leaders. I don't know if you remember the, the leader, uh, Wang Yi. He's a leader in the house church movement in China. And back in 2018, <clears throat> the Chinese government began to crack down on regulating Christianity more and more. And on December 9th, 2018, Wang Yi was arrested <clears throat> Is a pastor of an early uh, covenant church. I think it was called the Early Rain Covenant Church. Hundreds of the leaders and members of his church were detained, arrested, all their property, and then a lot of it was confiscated or destroyed by the government. And you might say, you know, why would the Chinese government do that to a church? Right? These are just decent citizens. They're trying to love their neighbor and worship God. But the most fundamental identity of the Chinese house church is that it refuses to comply with the government's demand to register with it and to submit to official structures that exist within the People's Republic of China for the regulation and oversight of all religious practice, including theology, preaching, pastoral education, right? So in short, spiritual governance. <laughs> and so the House Church Movement is a spiritual and political resistance movement. It is, guys. And that's who we are. We will not submit to the government and do things that are outside of the word of God. Amen. We do submit, right, when it's according to God's word. We honor that according to Romans 13. When it goes outside of the word of God, we will resist. You might say, well, you know, that happens in other countries. You know, I mean, we're here in America. We don't have to think about that kind of thing. Well, I was just talking to one of our members in our church this week. Praying outside here in Bellingham, Washington, he's praying outside of Planned Parenthood. And just this week, it's uh, part of the 40 days of life that's happening right now, where Christians around the country they're they're doing prayer vigils to stop the abortion industry. It's been uh, you know the Christian position for thousands of years of you know, the value, well, a couple thousand, <laughs> of the value of human lives within the womb. And I actually, I just heard this statistic a couple of weeks ago that globally there are 73 million abortions each year. 73 million. And it's, just to put that in perspective, the total number of people who die in the world, that died in the world in 2023, the total number of all other causes was 61 million. 73 million abortions. By the way, I just want to say to you, right, I mean, if you're here at Global Family, Today, and you've had an abortion, I want you to know that you're welcome here at Global Family. You're loved here. And uh, we want you to know that you have a family, and we want you to experience the grace and the truth of Jesus Christ. And it's healing, it's life changing. Amen. It's the power of the gospel. It's the Father's love towards you today. We'll absolutely experience that love and welcome in this family. We're committed to that, and you'll experience it from Jesus Christ. But, but what we're standing against, and what these Christians are standing in my city against, is the abortion industry. But here's the thing. The Bellingham police told these Christians who were praying and shedding light on the abortion industry that people will feel even harassed a little bit 
it doesn't even matter how nice what you said was. <laughs> have a nice day. What have some, you know, we have some resources if you want them, right? If they think your intention, the, the police in our city, if they think your intentions are bad, you could actually be arrested. And that happened in Bellingham this week. I mean, it's like it's like thought police kind of stuff. Your intentions you didn't even do anything that could get you arrested. So the church speaking the truth is a political and spiritual resistance movement. We stand on the authority of the word of God. Listen, guys, our master Jesus was crucified by a government. They knew that even though he was, wasn't a revolutionary, he was still a threat. And so what makes the difference between revolution and resignation on the one hand versus reformation and resistance on the other? Okay, this is the big difference. Revolution and resignation come when we don't trust God. And so when we take things into our own hands, right, revolutions are like, God's not going to do anything. We got to overthrow this, and we're going to have to try and fix it. No, you're not going to fix it. You're just going to be a hypocrite, in fact, in most cases. <laughs> and resignation says, God's not going to do anything, so we might as well just go along with it. Oh, listen, reformation and resistance comes when we believe Jesus is building his kingdom, ecclesia, on the earth. It's not our power. It's not our wisdom. It's not our purposes. There's not a molecule of human life that is left untouched by the claims of Jesus that he is the Lord of all. God, the things that are God's, he's talking about everything, including Caesar. That is our political ideology. And so the great saying of the early Christians, let it be ours as well. Christ is Lord. When we think about over 60 elections in nations around the world this year, and, and, and with the enemy working overtime, I believe to try and change the time and laws, according to Daniel 7.25, it's critical that intercessors like you and I stand united in prayer for the cause of righteous rule. Right? Solomon offered the wisdom, right? When the godly are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked are in power, they groan. Right? Again, uh, Proverbs 11.10, when the righteous thrive, the city rejoices. When the righteous triumph, there is great glory. But when the wicked rise, men hide themselves. And as Christians, we may not always agree on every political issue, but we can all agree on Matthew 6.10. We want to see God's will be done and his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We can agree with the fact that the kingdom of God according to the parables of Jesus, that they are like seed and like yeast that are growing and increasing into every sphere of culture, including the political realm. Amen? Uh, now, again, it, it doesn't happen always in our time. And, and, and there's times when it's growing slowly, and that's what it feels like. But listen, it is growing, hallelujah, unto the return of Jesus. So we want to pray towards that end with a hopeful vision. We want to pray for God to raise up a remnant of reformers in the political arena, in the sphere of government. We can also agree that we need government officials in our nation who will stand for righteousness and religious liberty, according to 1 Timothy 2, religious liberty, so the gospel can be proclaimed. And we can agree that God wants to bring a great awakening, amen, a great harvest. I think prayer is a forerunner of revival. Now, let me say this, too, because we've seen this in nations where even in the prayer movements where we don't have unity in how we're praying. And so I want to ask all of us, especially here in Global Family, to have a Maybe we could call it a united prayer anointing. <laughs> David the king 
who never lost a battle, okay, understood this powerful truth. Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron running down on the edge of his garments. It's like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commands the blessing, life forevermore. I want to see the Lord's commanded blessings in our nations. Amen? And I know you do too. So the question then is how do we pray with one accord and tap into that power, that anointing, that blessing when we have different political perspectives. We might even be voting for opposing candidates. But we can unite around God's will in a spirit of humility, amen, as the kingdom of God. And so here's some thoughts that I want us to uh, think about as we're uh, agreeing in prayer for these uh, year's elections, okay? Maybe just put a few of these in the chat. Uh, I'm going to put this together in a little document as well, but number one, we want to pray the word of God. God's word is his will, right? We know that when we pray anything according to his will, he hears us, and we know that he hears us. Uh, we, Whatever we ask, we know that we have what we've asked, that, that he's going to give it to us. It's a powerful promise with so much hanging in the balance in nations this year. Let's pray the Bible. And number two, let's pray values, kingdom values, righteous values. Discern what's most important to God and don't compromise the truth of God's word and how you pray and how you vote as best you can, okay? Uh, number three, pray for righteous rulership in your nation. Amen. Amen. Uh, number four, let's pray for candidates who prioritize religious freedom to keep or take office. And I think that's the idea. Again, I'm thinking about that in light of the harvest. How do we have righteous leaders that will be appointed and anointed by God uh, to create the greatest environment for the advance of the gospel? Okay, to pray that direction, God will answer. I want to pray for safe, peaceful, and just elections. Okay. Um, Next, we want to pray against corruption and integrity at the polling stations. That God, by his light, would expose corruption. Uh, next one, we want to pray against political violence before, during, and after elections. Amen. This is a big issue in some of the nations going on right now. Pray for shalom, for the peace of God. Uh, next, we want to pray for candidates to be surrounded by godly advisors. They would have wisdom. They would have godly counsel with them. Uh, next, I want to pray for uh, integrity or maybe pray for honesty in campaigns. As people that are campaigning, that they would tell the truth. Okay, they wouldn't deceive the people. They'd be made of their word. Uh, <clears throat> next, I want to pray for the media. Uh, who report that they would report truthfully. Uh, <clears throat> uh, God would raise up authentic media outlets to share the truth about what's going on so that God would remove the, the deception, that we would shine the light of truth, okay? Uh, <clears throat> Next, we want to pray persistently. No matter what the media reports, Jesus says that we should pray and never give up. And we pray according to the will of God and the reign and rule of God, amen, according to what God wants to do. Uh, again, we may need to pray not just this election, but the next one and the next one, right? We want a culture of prayer in the church where we don't give up. Next thing we want to pray is the Holy Spirit leads you. You know, we need to be praying and asking for uh, revelation from the Holy Spirit about how to pray according to God's will. Amen. Uh, let me close with this. It's uh, <clears throat> I come from a Presbyterian background. And it's been said of Mary, the Queen of Scots, <clears throat> that she feared the prayers of revivalist, one of my favorite Presbyterian revivalists, John Knox. She feared his prayers more than all the armies of Scotland. <laughs> I'm not quite there yet, to be honest. <laughs> but, oh, I want to get there. Hey, listen, 
said, Satan fears the prayers of the saints because he knows our united intercession in Jesus' name is more powerful than any earthly army. And then he works to distract us from praying, right? Or to divide us along political party lines because he fears what will happen when we pray in one accord. He wants to stop the great awakening, the great harvest, the revival, and the reformation that's on God's heart. And so when we stand together as God's global family, God will get the glory. Amen? Listen, imagine the power of prayer camps, prayer meetings around the world agreeing with God in intercession for his perfect will in our respective elections. There are 2.6 billion Christ followers walking the earth today. When we unite under the banner of Jesus in his kingdom, praying for his will to be done, his kingdom to come, listen, we will unleash tremendous prayer power. So I just encourage us to vote and to pray and pray some more and may God's perfect will be done in these elections this year. God can do immeasurably more than all we could ever ask or even imagine. It's for his glory, amen, it's for our joy, and ultimately it's for the salvation of multitudes of peoples that come to know him, for whole nations and peoples to be discipled in the ways of God. Amen, amen.